Good evening, and welcome. Tonight, I'm going to be reading to you this book about the myths of the ancient Persians. I'm really excited for this book because I didn't know anything about Persian mythology before I started my series on Iran, and I think it's really fascinating. So let's just dive in and learn more about it. The ancient Persians. Um, I think we'll skip this one, because this is just about what mythology is. We're going to start here with Meet the Ancient Persians. Look at this beautiful picture. At the crossroads. The present-day nation of Iran sits at the heart of the Middle East. Until recently, people of the Western world called this country by a different name. Persia. In ancient times, the Persians built the largest empire that the world had ever seen, stretching over most of Asia and parts of Europe and Africa. The homeland of the ancient Persians was rugged and unforgiving. Iran is one of the driest, most mountainous places on earth. The central part of the country is a vast plateau consisting mainly of barren plains and salt deserts. Surrounding the plateau are towering mountain ranges. The Zagros Mountains run more than 600 miles along the shores of the Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea. The Alborz Mountains rise from a narrow coastal plain lining the shores of the salty Caspian Sea. There are no major river systems in Iran. The only navigable river is the Karun, which flows from the Zagros Mountains to the Persian Gulf. In the early spring, many other small rivers and streams form from snow melting in the mountain ranges. The waters flow from the mountains into the central plateau, draining into saltwater lakes. Within a few weeks or months, most of the rivers and lakes dry up in the blistering summer heat. Geography played a major role in Persian history and culture. Because of its central location, the country was an important trade link between the Western and Eastern worlds. The people of Western Persia had frequent contacts with the ancient Greeks and Romans. Those in Eastern Persia were influenced more by the ancient Indians and other Asian peoples. In turn, neighboring peoples absorbed many Persian ideas and beliefs. Geography also helped shape Persian mythology. Many of the traditional tales of Persia take place in a land of dusty plains and towering mountains. In Ahura Mazda and the Good Creation, which I think is our first story, we will learn how the mountains and other land features were formed during the first great battle between the forces of good and evil. Here's a map of the Persian Empire around 500 BCE. You can see all of this was Persia. And all the different lands. You can see Greece here, Thrace, Scythia, Lydia, Babylonia, Medea, Parsa, Parthia, down here's Arabia, India, Central Asia, and Egypt. The glories of Persia. This beautiful art. Many historians believe that the first Persians were nomads from Central Asia, known as the Aryans. Sometime around 1800 to 1500 BCE, groups of Aryans began to migrate southward and settle among the peoples of the Iranian plateau. By the 9th century BCE, two major Aryan tribes dominated the land. The Medes ruled over the kingdom of Medea in the northwestern in northwestern Iran. The Persians lived mainly to the south in a region called Fars or Parsa. Around 550 BCE, Cyrus II took the throne of Parsa. Cyrus was a brilliant military commander who led his armies to victory over Medea. He went on to conquer the kingdoms of Lydia in modern-day Turkey and Babylonia in today's Iraq. Persian forces also seized Greek colonies on the coast of the Aegean Sea. The empire established by Cyrus the Great was known as the Achaemenid Persian Empire after the legendary founder of the king's dynasty or royal family line. 
Darius I, who became king in 522 BCE, took the Achaemenid Persian Empire to its greatest heights, power, and glory. Darius extended Persian control over an area reaching as far east as the Indus River in India and as far north as the Danube River in southeastern Europe. He built a network of royal roads connecting the far-flung lands of his realm. He also built splendid palaces and other monuments at two of his capital cities, Susa and Persepolis. About 200 years after Darius built his vast empire, the ancient Greeks took it away. Greek forces under the command of Alexander the Great marched across Persia, defeating the armies of the last Achaemenid king. Alexander looted Susa and burned Persepolis to the ground. He conquered Babylonia, Egypt, and all the other lands of the once great Persian Empire. In the centuries following the Greek conquest, a series of different peoples and dynasties ruled over Persia. The Seleucid dynasty, founded by one of Alexander's generals, introduced many elements of Greek culture to the Middle East. The Parthians, an Iranian people originally from Central Asia, established a prosperous empire that endured for more than 300 years. Then, in the 3rd century BCE, the Parthians fell to a Persian dynasty called the Sasanians. The Sasanian kings founded a second Persian empire, recapturing many of the lost lands of the old empire and reviving the glories of the past. In 642 CE, Arab Muslim armies overthrew the last Sasanian king. That conquest marked the end of the ancient Persian empires. It also introduced a new religion, Islam, which would remain a powerful influence in Iran to the present day. Kings, nobles, and commoners. The kings of ancient Persia claimed that their right to rule came directly from their god, Ahura Mazda. As the god's chosen representative on earth, the king enjoyed tremendous power and majesty. Would you look at the picture? He also had a sacred responsibility to live according to the divine laws, ruling in justice, compassion, and righteousness. Persia's kings controlled their sprawling domains through a sophisticated government system. Beginning in early imperial times, the empire was divided into 20 provinces or satrapies. The king appointed loyal Persian nobles to serve as the governors of each satrapy. A host of other officials performed, performed a wide variety of roles in the provincial governments. In addition, a number of high-ranking government officials served at the royal court. These included the king's advisors, the heads of government departments, court judges, and royal scribes. High-ranking government officials, military officers, and priests belonged to the Persian upper class. This small, powerful group also included the king's relatives and members of other important families, the wealthiest Persian nobles lived in great luxury, or on large estates worked by hundreds of servants and slaves. Because most ancient Persian texts focused on the upper class, we do not know much about the lives of less privileged people. There was a small but thriving middle class. This class was made up of merchants and skilled workers such as carpenters, metal workers, and weavers. The great majority of Persians, however, belonged to this lower class. These downtrodden people included both paid freemen and unpaid serfs. Most freemen were unskilled laborers or farmers who scraped out a living on their own on small plots of land. Serfs worked in fields belonging to their rich landowners. A landowner allowed a serf to live and work on a parcel of land, and in exchange the serf owed the owner a sizable share of the harvest. At the bottom of the social scale were the slaves. Slaves might be prisoners taken in war, freemen enslaved for debt or crime, or children born to a slave. In general, Persian slaves were well treated. In fact, slaves who belonged to well-to-do nobles often lived better than poor farmers or serfs. From the king and the head of the society to the husband and the head of the farm family, Persian society was dominated by men. Women generally were expected to dedicate themselves to their responsibilities as wives and mothers. Most women received little education and had little or no say over matters affecting their lives. These restrictions are reflected in Persian mythology. For the most part, the women of the myths lived in a male-dominated world. 
In this book, we will meet several mythical women known almost exclusively for their roles as the mothers of powerful heroes. The Teachings of Zarathustra The Aryan nomads who lived in Central Asia thousands of years ago believed in a multitude of gods, goddesses, and other supernatural beings. These deities held power over the sun, moon, sky, water, wind, fertility, war, and many other aspects of nature and everyday life. Sometimes the gods were kindly and generous. At other times, they could be cruel. The people tried to win the favor of these unpredictable beings through prayers and religious rituals. Sometime between 1800 and 1500 BCE, the prophet Zarathustra, also known as Zardosht or Zoroaster, revolutionized the ancient Aryans' beliefs. Zarathustra condemned the worship of many gods. He taught that there was only one supreme deity, Ahura Mazda. This all-good, all-wise god created the universe and all the good things in it. Zarathustra also emphasized the importance of personal choice and responsibility. According to his teachings, Ahura Mazda is engaged in a constant battle with an evil spirit called Agravanyo. That cosmic battle between good and evil is central to life on Earth as well. All men and women are born with free will, meaning that they have the freedom to choose how to live their lives. Those who choose to follow the path of goodness and truth give strength to Ahura Mazda. That hastens the day when the Supreme God will triumph over Agramenu, and the world will be cleansed of evil and suffering. When the ancient Persians and other Aryan tribes migrated to the Iranian plateau, they brought Zarathustra's teachings with them. As the centuries went by, the prophet's message developed into a religion known as Zoroastrianism. This new faith combined Zarathustra's ideas with elements of earlier Aryan beliefs and practices. The Achaemenid kings, especially Darius I, embraced Zoroastrianism. Eight centuries later, the Sasanians made it the official religion of their new Persian empire. Following the Arab conquest in the 7th century CE, most Persians converted to Islam. Today, there are fewer than 200,000 followers of Zoroastrianism in the world, living mainly in Iran and India, with smaller communities in the United States, Canada, and parts of Europe. Despite its declining numbers, this ancient faith has left behind a powerful legacy. Scholars believed that the principles of Zoroastrianism including ideas about a supreme god, heaven and hell, and a final judgment day, influenced the development of major world religions including Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. The Sacred Fire The religion that developed from Zarathustra's teachings combined the prophet's revolutionary ideas with rites and practices, reaching back countless years. The main instrument of Zoroastrian worship was fire, which I actually have a candle going over here. I usually do when it's really cold. There we go, and I warm my hands over it, so I have the sacred fire going during this, I suppose. Um, the early Aryans had worshipped their gods with burnt offerings. For the followers of Zoroastrianism, fire became a symbol of truth and purity, marking a path to the great Ahura Mazda himself. Many Zoroastrian religious rituals were, and still are, conducted in the presence of a sacred fire. At first, these fires were built outdoors or in household hearths. Later, the Persians began to build special fire temples. Priests tended the flames that burned on altars in these magnificent stone buildings. Another important feature of Zoroastrian worship, dating back to earlier traditions, was the Haoma ritual. Haoma was the name of an ancient god of immortality as well as a plant. The juice of this plant was a mild stimulant. Cool picture. Priests drink Haoma juice as part of their chief worship ceremony, the Yasna, in order to become more open to divine visions. The priests of ancient Persia were called Magi. These honored men presided over a daily round of temple rituals, reciting many complicated prayers, hymns, and sacred formulas by heart. 
Zoroastrians believed that the correct performance of these rituals honored Ahura Mazda and also helped the god in his battle against evil. Ordinary Persians worshipped not only at the fire temples but also at home and outdoors. They might stand beside a river or face the sun, offering their prayers to the great god who created the waters and the heavenly bodies. Zarathustra said to have directed his followers to pray five times a day. The prophet also prescribed seven great religious festivals. On these holy days, the entire community came together to worship Uhura Mazda and share a joyous feast. The highest holiday was the New Year festival, or Navroz, held on the first day of spring. Today, Zoroastrians still observe this ancient festival, celebrating the renewal of life and the glorious day to come when good will triumph over evil once and for all. Alright, let's get into the mythology stories. Timeless Tales of Ancient Persia The Origin of the World and Humans Ahura Mazda and the Good Creation the early Persians told several different stories about the origins of the world and the first people. Their best-known creation story has come down to us through the teachings of Zarathustra. As the founder of Zoroastrianism, Zarathustra often retold the ancient myths of his people, drawing on the lessons and the stories to reinforce his message. The Zoroastrian creation story revolves around Ahura Mazda, the supreme god who is the source of all that is good in the universe. Ahura Mazda watches over the world with the help of an army of heavenly beings. These divinities include a group of powerful angels called the Amesha Spentas, or holy immortals, a host of divine spirits called the Yazatas, or spirits worthy of worship, and the Fravashis, which are the immortal souls of mortal men and women. Opposing Ahura Mazda is Agramanyu. This devil-like spirit is the source of all that is evil. He constantly strives to destroy the good creation of Ahura Mazda and to lure people into the wo his world of lies and wickedness. A host of horrible demons assist him in his wicked schemes. According to Zoroastrian beliefs, the constant struggle between good and evil led to the creation. Ahura Mazda made the world for a specific purpose to serve as the arena in which he would confront his eternal enemy. His first battle with Agramanyu gave the world its present form and set the heavenly bodies in motion. At one point, it looked as if the evil spirit would triumph, resulting in the destruction of all life on Earth. In the end, though, Ahura Mazda and his angels proved more powerful. Here we go. The Light and the Dark the world was created, Ahura Mazda lived above in a kingdom of endless light. Far below, in an abyss of eternal darkness, dwelt the evil spirit of Gramanyu. Between the two was a vast empty space so that good and evil existed without contact. Agramanyu was so ignorant that he was not aware of Ahura Mazda's existence, but the Supreme Lord knew all about the wicked spirit. In his wisdom, he understood that he had to create a place to confront and defeat evil. So Ahura Mazda set the good creation in motion. He began by forming a substance of pure spirit. The bright white spirit filled the universe with radiance. When its light pierced the darkness, Agramanyu rushed out to destroy it. But the glory of the spirit was too great to overcome. Defeated, the evil one slunk back to his gloomy kingdom. There he produced many terrible fiends and demons, whose sole purpose for existence was destruction. Ahura Mazda already knew how the conflict between good and evil would end. Even so, in his infinite goodness and mercy, he went to speak with Agramanyu. Save yourself and your creatures, said the wise lord. Offer praise to the light, and I will grant you immortality. Agramanyu just laughed at the god's generous offer. He believed that the Supreme Lord must be weak and frightened to come begging for peace. I will never praise you, he shouted. I will destroy you forever and force all your creatures to worship me instead. Now Ahura Mazda knew that the evil one could not really defeat him, but he also could see far into the future, to the days of humankind. Among men and women, there would 
would be many misguided individuals who would practice wrong more than right. If the conflict between good and evil went on too long, Akramanyu might be able to persuade those people to join his side. So Ahura Mazda proposed that the war last for a fixed period of time only. For 9,000 years, the two enemies would fight, and then their contest would be over. Akramanyu foolishly agreed to the time limit. The moment he gave his consent, his doom was sealed. Reciting a powerful prayer, Ahura Mazda unveiled a vision of the future. When Agramanyu beheld his own utter downfall, he shrieked in horror and fell back into his gloomy pit. There he would remain for three thousand years, stunned and powerless. The First Battle While Agramanyu lay helpless, Ahura Mazda was preparing for battle. First, the wise lord shaped the spirit of light into a host of divinities. He made the six Amishas Pentas, whose names are Good Thought, Best Order, Desirable Dominion, Holy Devotion, Wholeness, and Immortality. He created the Yazatas, divine spirits who would aid in the battle against evil. Ahura Mazda also made the immortal souls of men and women, known as the Farvashis. Next, Ahura Mazda created the world in the shape of a giant sphere. The top half formed a dome, and the bottom half was filled with sweet waters. He lighted the sky with the sun, moon, and stars. He made the flat disk of the earth and set it floating on the waters. In the center of the earth, Ahura Mazda placed a sturdy tree, a white ox, and a human called Gaio Maritan. All of the gods' creations were perfect. The tree was smooth without bark or thorn. The skin of the ox was as bright as the moon, and the human's body shined like the sun. By now, three thousand years had passed. Agramanyu finally revived from his stupor. At the sight of the good creation, the evil spirit was filled with rage and envy. With a monstrous cry, he summoned his demons and sprang forth to attack the world. The whole of creation shook with the coming of evil. The sky shattered, dislodging the sun, moon, and stars from their fixed stations. The heavenly bodies began to move across the sky. The sun brought the first day and night, and the moon commenced the marking of the months. Agramanyu surged on through the sweet waters, fouling them with salt. Then, like a serpent striking its prey, he pierced the earth in the middle. The force of the blow sent ripples across the land forming the high mountains and deep valleys. The evil one unleashed the whirlwinds and sandstorms. He poisoned the great tree and all the plants. He set loose venomous snakes, lizards, and scorpions until the whole earth was covered with noxious creatures. The world was so black and injured at midday that it seemed like the darkest of nights. Last of all, Agramanyu turned his wrath on the white ox and the mortal Kaiomaritan. He attacked them with many moral and physical evils. Greed, lust, laziness, pain, hunger, disease. The ox's body shattered into pieces. The human lived on in the blighted landscape. While he struggled to survive, the heavenly angels battled the demons, each good spirit grappling with its evil counterpart. After thirty years, Gaiomaritan finally fell to the demon of death. The triumph the light. My victory is complete, cried Agramanyu. The good creation is ruined. The evil spirit turned to lead his forces home in triumph. Suddenly, a shining angel clad in the golden armor of a warrior blocked his path. Behind the angel was arrayed a mighty host of Farvashis, mounted on the war horses, spears in hand. Now that you have come into the world, we will not let you go, said the heavenly forces. Agramanyu cried out in rage, but it was too late. In a flash, Ahura Mazda surrounded the sky with a thick wall. The world that the Supreme Lord had created became his enemy's prison. To this day, the souls of the righteous stand guard over that fortress, preventing the evil one from escaping. Once Agramanyu was trapped, Ahura Mazda and his angels set to work reviving the world. They crushed the fallen tree and mixed its juices with water. 
The mixture rained down upon the earth, washing away all the noxious creatures. The seas and lakes formed, and the rivers began to flow. The parts of the ox's body still lay scattered across the land. As the rains fell, all kinds of plants began to spring from the animal's organs. The seed that the ox had spilled when he died rose up to the moon. Purified by the light, it returned to the earth and gave life to many different species of animals. Gaiomaritan's body had also given forth seed at his death. That seed was carried up into the sky and purified in the radiant light of the sun. It returned to the earth, where it lay buried for forty years, warmed by the sun and nourished by the life-giving rains. Finally, the first human couple, Mashie and Mashiani, grew up out of the soil. From this couple would come all the generations of men and women. Thus, humankind, like all the rest of the good creation, arose from the first battle between good and evil. We're going to skip the direct quotes from the holy books or whatever. All the ancient poems. Tales from the Shanama. First Earthly Kings Persian mythology was concerned not only with the cosmic battle between good and evil, but also with the grand adventures of kings and heroes. Over time, Persian priests and scribes wove together the ancient heroic tales of their people to create a fabulous history of the empire. The kings in this mythical history had many, had nearly godlike powers. They introduced civilization at the very beginnings of the world. They also defeated the emerging culture of Persia from monsters, demons, and other evil forces. The best-known source of Persian heroic tales is the Shanama, or Book of Kings, written by the poet Ferdowsi in the late 10th to early 11th century CE. Ferdowsi based his famous epic poem on ancient Iranian myths and Zoroastrian traditions. The Shanama tells the story of Persia and its kings all the way from the creation of the world to the Arab conquest. It celebrates the glorious cultural heritage of the Persian people. It also traces the Zoroastrian religion from its dawn to the defeat of the last Zoroastrian king. The opening chapters of Ferdowsi's book are based on ancient myths about the early days of the world. According to the Shanama, the first human, Kayumars, was also the first king. A little asterisk saying um, that the Shanama was written in a late form of Persian language called Neat Persian or Farsi. In that language, Gayomaritan, the world's first human, is known as Kayumars. The supreme god Ahura Mazda is called Ormazd, and the evil spirit Akramanyu is called Ahriman. Take note. Mars gave the world law, religion, and other important elements of culture. He was succeeded on the throne by his grandson, Hushang. This wise king introduced irrigation and discovered the secret of making fire. Persia's next mythical ruler was Timuris, known as the Binder of Demons. I lost my place. Okay. One of this king's most celebrated acts was his capture of Ahriman. In our first myth, we saw that the supreme god Ahura Mazda trapped the evil spirit after their first battle. Ahriman could not completely destroy the world from within his prison, but he was still capable of spreading lies, wickedness, and misfortune. Timoris temporarily put a halt to these dark deeds in a way that was particularly humiliating to the evil spirit. Let's find out what happened, starting with the sorrow of Kayumar. Who was the first man to sit upon the throne of Persia? Ancient tales tell us that it was Kayumars. When the world was young, this good king lived in the mountains. He dressed himself and his people in animal skins. It was Kayumars who gave us the arts of preparing food and clothing in those early days when civilization was still in its infancy. Kayumars also introduced the first code of laws. People came from all over the world to receive his laws and hear his wise counsel. Even the animals, both wild and tame, came to honor him. Seated on his high throne, Kayumar shined like the sun in his goodness and glory. All who saw him knelt down as though in prayer, 
awed by his God-given splendor. Thus began the very idea of reverence, which would give rise to religion. Kayumars and his queen were blessed with a son named Shimak. This handsome youth was wise, skillful, and eager for fame. The sight of him filled the king's heart with happiness. One thing only did Kayumars fear, the thought of somehow losing his beloved child. For thirty years, Kayumars reigned in peace, but even his royal virtues could not hold back evil forever. Ahriman was growing more and more jealous of the king's glory. Finally, the evil spirit could stand it no longer. He summoned his own son, a dark demon who was as fearless and savage as a wolf. At his father's command, the mighty demon gathered an army and set out to seize the throne. That night, the angel Shorush, who watches over the children of Ormazd, appeared before Prince Shiamak. The young man seethed with fury when the angel told him about the plot against his father. Quickly, Shiamak assembled his own warriors. He arrayed himself in a leopard skin, for armor had not yet been invented. Then he strode forth at the head of his troops to stop the demon army. The two forces met on a broad, dusty plain. Shiamak stepped forward to challenge the son of Ahriman. The young prince used all his strength in the deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat, but the dark demon proved too powerful. He sank his deadly claws into the prince's unprotected body, and the noble son of the king perished. When Kayumars learned of his son's death, the world turned black around him. Falling from his throne, he wailed in anguish and tore his face until his cheeks ran with blood. For an entire year the king wept without ceasing, and the entire kingdom mourned with him. At last Ormast sent Sorush with a message for the king. Weep no more. It is time to collect your troops and rid the earth of that vile demon. When he heard the angel's words, Kayumars wiped away his tears. Lifting his face to the heavens, he asked Ormast for strength against his enemies. And the king turned his heart and mind to vengeance. Prince Siamak had left behind a son named Hushang. The splendid youth was the very image of his father. As soon as Kayumars resolved on war, he sent for his beloved grandson. I mean to march against the dark demon, said the king, but I am old and worn out. You must command my army. Hushang leaped at the chance to avenge his father's death. Soon the royal army was on the march, with the king's intrepid young grandson leading. The ranks of the army were filled out with warrior angels, as well as leopards, lions, wolves, tigers, and other fierce creatures. The dark demon himself led the enemy forces, but the evil host could not withstand the fury of the king's army. The angels and roaring beasts utterly destroyed the demon warriors. Meanwhile, Hushang battled his father's murderer. The prince seized the son of Ahriman like a lion gripping its prey. He tore the dark demon's body in two. Then he cut off the monster's head and trampled it in the mud. At last, Kayumars had achieved his vengeance. With a peaceful sigh, the good king lay down and died. The world was deprived of his glory, but his might and wisdom would never be forgotten. Hushang and the Gift of after the death of Kayumars, Hushang ascended to the throne. Like his grandfather, the new king was wise and good. His reign saw the establishment of justice and law across the land. Hushang also introduced many valuable arts to the untamed world. Chief among these was the secret of making fire. One day the king was riding in the mountains when a monster suddenly appeared. The beast was huge and black with eyes like raging pools of blood. Smoke billowed from its gaping jaws, plunging the world into darkness. As the monster rushed toward him, Hushong calmly picked up a stone and hurled it with all his might. The monster fled, and the stone collided with a large boulder, producing a spark. Curious, the king hit the boulder again. Again came the flash, as the iron stone struck the flint rock. Thus Hushong discovered the fiery nature of flint gives off sparks whenever one strikes it with iron. Bowing low, 
the king thanked Ormuzd for the gift of fire. That night he and his companions built a towering bonfire and celebrated with a great feast. From that day forth, faithful men and women have offered their prayers toward the sacred fire. Hushang also found many earthly uses for the heaven-sent flames. He taught his people how to use fire to separate iron from the rocks. He invented the forge so that blacksmiths could make axes, saws, hatchets, and other tools and weapons from iron. With the help of their new tools, farmers planted and harvested the first crops. The king showed them how to dig irrigation canals so that the rivers and lakes would water their fields. Wuxiang also used his god-given authority to separate the animals. Some beasts remained wild for hunting. Others were tamed and set to work for humankind. Oxen and donkeys began to pull plows and haul loads. Cows, sheep, and goats provided their meat, milk, and hides. For forty years the heavens revolved over the throne of Wuxiang. The king toiled without ceasing, and the earth flourished under his care. Then he departed for a better life in heaven, leaving behind his good name and the fruits of his labor. The Binder of Demons The next man to sit on the throne of Persia was Hushang's son, Tamoris. This wise and noble ruler continued his father's good works. He taught the farmers how to shear the sheep and goats, spin the wool, and weave garments and carpets. He trained the wild hawks and falcons to assist the hunters. He told his people to praise the creator who had given them dominion over the animals. The greatest achievement of Tamoris was his victory over the demons. When the king took the throne, he swore to cleanse the world of evil and ignorance. Shining with the light of his God-given glory, he went forth to battle the evil spirit. Train in the distance. With his powerful magic spells, he transformed Ahriman into the shape of a horse. He placed a bridle over the evil one's head and a saddle on his back. For thirty years, the triumphant king rode around the earth on the back of his conquered enemy. When the demons beheld their leader's humiliation, they roared in outrage. Banding together in a great army, they prepared to overthrow Tamoris. The king soon learned of their plans and led his warriors forth to battle. He's on the horse. The army of the demons was like a vast tide of gloom. Their breath blackened the air, and their foul stench rose to the heavens. Then Tamora strode forth at the head of his forces. The king quickly subdued two-thirds of the demons with his spells and disposed of the other third with his massive iron mace. Bound and wounded, the remaining demons groveled in the dust. Do not destroy us, they begged. We can teach you a valuable new art. So Tamoris agreed to spare the lives of the demons. He freed them from their chains and released Ahriman from his enchantment. The conquered demons brought forth pens and ink and taught the king the art of writing. They showed him not just one script, but almost thirty, including the Persian, Chinese, Arab and Western ways of writing. Thus from the servants of the evil spirit came a great blessing for humankind. For thirty more years, Tamoris ruled in wisdom and righteousness. Then his days too came to an end. Though he passed away, the world will always remember the noble king honored as the binder of demons. The Golden Age. Yima saves the world. Saru of Kayumars on page 43 told us that Kayumars was the world's first mortal king. That story was based on the Shanama. In a number of other Persian tales, the role of first king went to Yima. Often called the greatest of all kings, Yima presided over a golden age of peace and abundance. In fact, the world was such a paradise under his reign that the king had to enlarge it three times to make a room for all the people and animals. The Golden Age of Yima came to an end with a worldwide disaster. The story of that catastrophe is similar to tales of a great flood told by ancient peoples all over the world. In the ancient Persian myth, deadly cold replaces the flood waters. 
After the creator god Ahura Mazda warns Yima that a terrible winter is coming, the king builds a giant vara, or enclosure. He fills the safe haven with the best of all the plants, animals, and people on earth. When the killing storms strike, the seeds of new life live on inside Yima's vara. Our retelling of the myth of Yima is drawn from the Avesta. This collection of ancient prayers, hymns, and other sacred texts is the holiest book of the Zoroastrian religion. The central part of the Avesta is believed to contain the words of the prophet Zarathustra himself. Zarathustra denounced Yima as a sinner who worshipped the ancient gods with animal sacrifices. As a result of the prophet's condemnation, a wide variety of contradictory tales developed about the mythical ruler. In most Persian myths, Yima still shines as the king of the golden age and the savior of life on earth. In other stories, however, he is a tragic figure who loses his throne when he dares to proclaim himself equal to Ahura Mazda. Years of Peace and Plenty At the dawn of the world, there lived a good shepherd named Yima. Ahura Mazda spoke to the shepherd, Shiny Yima, will you watch over my creation and make it thrive? Yes, the shepherd answered. I will rule over your world and nourish it. While I am king, there will be neither freezing wind nor scorching heat, neither disease nor death. So Ahura Mazda gave Yima a golden ring and a dagger. With these two symbols of his authority, the shepherd king began his brilliant reign. For three hundred years, the world thrived under his care. There were no bitter cold winters or blazing hot summers. There were no hunger, there was no hunger or thirst, no sickness or old age or death. No demon dared to show his face in a world where everything was good. Then Ahura Mazda spoke to Yima again. Shining Yima, the earth is so prosperous that it has become overcrowded. Soon there will be no more room for the flocks of birds and the herds of animals, for the men and women and their sacred fires. The king thanked the creator for his warning. He pressed his golden ring against the earth and thrust his golden dagger into the soil. He called out to the shining spirit of the earth, O oh, Spenta or Maiti, kindly open and stretch yourself afar. There is a shudder, a groan, an ear-splitting crack. Suddenly the surface of the earth began to stretch. The horizons on all sides faded into the distance as the world grew one-third larger than it had been before. Now came another three hundred years of peace and plenty. The population of the earth continued to multiply under the care of Yima. Again Ahura Mazda warned the king that the world was becoming too full. Again, Yima pressed his ring to the ground and pierced the soil with his dagger. The earth stretched out once more until it was two-thirds larger than it had been at the creation. Yet another three hundred years passed. Now there were more flocks and herds and people than ever before. A third time, Yima called on the shining angel Spenta Armaiti. A third time, the earth grew, making room for all its creatures. And that is how the world grew twice as large as it had been at the creation. That is how it became the size it is today, thanks to the good king Yima. Three Fatal Winters For nine hundred years Yima had ruled over the world. Under his reign all living things had thrived. Agramanyu, lord of evil, could not stand the sight of such peace and abundance. Finally, the wicked spirit decided to put an end to the world's happiness. Ahura Mazda was well aware of Agramanyu's evil plans. The creator spoke to the king, saying, Shining Yima, a catastrophe is about to befall the world. Three terrible winters are coming, bringing deep snows and fierce foul frost. All the creatures of the earth shall perish, those that live in the wilderness, those that live in the mountains, and those that live in the shelter of the valleys. To save the earth, you must build a vara. This enclosure shall be a great square, as long as a riding ground on every side. You shall fill the vara with the seeds of every different plant and tree. You shall bring every kind of creature, men and women, sheep and oxen, dogs and birds. Take care that you choose only the best and most beautiful creatures, 
the strongest and most sweet-smelling plants. Nothing must be tainted with weakness, meanness, or deceit. Nothing must bear the evil mark of Agramanyo. Nima listened carefully and followed the god's instructions. He stamped his heel on the ground and gathered up a handful of crushed earth. He kneaded the earth in his hands the way a potter kneads clay. Then he used the magical soil to build a giant fara, two miles long on every side. He diverted a stream so that its waters flowed through the enclosure. He raised hills, carved out valleys, and shaped every other kind of landscape. At the heart of the compound, he built a small city with nine streets lined with pleasant houses. Next, the king planted seeds inside his vara. The seeds sprang up into wonderful plants and trees that would bear a never-ending supply of food. Yima settled birds along the lush banks of the stream. He found homes for all the different animals, each in its familiar surroundings. He brought hundreds of men, women, and children to the streets of the miniature city. Finally, when his work was finished, the king used his sacred golden ring to seal up the whole enclosure. The sun had been shining as Yima worked on the vara. The moment he completed his task, the first evil winter fell. Outside the enclosure, a chill breeze began to blow. Deadly frost crept over the fields and tree branches. Soon the snow lay so deep that even the tallest man could not forge a path through it. All the people, birds, and animals perished from cold and hunger. Meanwhile, inside the vara, all was light and warmth. For three winters, the people of this little world lived in perfect happiness. There was no lying, no envy, no poverty, decay, or disease. None of the marks with which the Lord of Evil stamps the bodies of mortals. At last, Agramanyu grew weary. The terrible storms afflicting the world faded, and the snows melted. Yima opened the door of the vara and new life poured forth into the barren landscape. The earth grew a fresh green carpet of grass, shrubs, and trees. The herds grazed in the fields. The wild animals roamed the young forests. The people began to till the soil and rebuild the cities and villages. They rekindled their sacred fires and gave thanks to Ahura Mazda. And they all sang the praises of Yima, the shepherd king who had built the Vara and saved the world's living creatures. Good triumphs over evil. Sahak, the Serpent King. Our next myth takes us back to the imaginative version of Persian history found in the Shanama. In that famous epic poem, Yima is called Jamshid. Jamshid was a great king who was eventually corrupted by his pride and ambition. As a result of his sins, his kingdom fell into chaos. People of Persia turned to the neighboring kingdom of Arabia for help in overthrowing their wicked ruler. Unfortunately, the Arab king was even worse than Jamshid. In fact, King Zahak was firmly in the clutches of the evil spirit Ahriman. The stories of Jamshid and Zahak give us some insight into the ancient Persians' ideas about kingship. The king had a duty to maintain order in society. He was supposed to ensure security, prosperity, and justice for all his subjects. Above all, he should never forget that his powers came directly from God, called Urmast in the new Persian language of the Shanama. When Jamshid and Zahak failed in their duties, they lost their God-given far or divine glory. In time, Urmast bestowed, bestowed the glory on a new hero, Feridun conquered evil and restored order in the world. These age-old tales of kings and heroes also tell us something about the early Iranians' view of themselves and other peoples. Ferdowsi, the author of the Shanama, grew up in the mid-900s, about three centuries after the Arab conquest. During this period, the people of Iran were beginning to rediscover and celebrate their ancient heritage. Ferdowsi based his book on ancient Persian mythology, ignoring the traditional stories of Iran's Arab rulers. According to his epic, the first great kings were Persians who ruled over all humanity from their homeland at the center of the world. It was Sahak, the Arab king, who brought disaster upon the world when he allowed Ahriman to creep into his heart. 
path of evil. In the days when Jamshid sat on the throne of Persia, King Merdas ruled the south in the land of the Arabs. Merdas was an honest and generous king who gave freely to his subjects. He was also a righteous man with a heart dead set against evil. Merdas had a son named Zahak. In his youth, this handsome prince was as brave and noble as his father. He spent most of his time riding about on his splendid Arab horses, spreading generosity throughout the desert kingdom. But Zahak had two great faults, vanity and excessive ambition. Ahriman, lord of evil, searched for a way to take advantage of these failings. Finally, the wicked spirit came up with a plan to replace the good king with his more easily influenced offspring. Ahriman disguised himself as an aged nobleman, called Iblis. He went to the royal court, where he used his charming conversation and lavish praise to befriend the unsuspecting prince. Once he had won Zahak's confidence, the evil one laid his trap. Your father is old and worn out, he said to the prince. How long will you remain a wretched subject when you deserve to be king of the world? At first, Zahak refused to listen to such wicked talk. Gradually, his pride and ambition overcame his devotion to his father. Very well, he said. Tell me how I can gain my rightful throne. Early the next morning, good King Meridas went to his orchard to pray, as was his custom. Iblis had dug a deep pit in the orchard path. In the dim light before dawn, the king fell into the hole. A reverend man's back broke and his life departed. Zahak and Iblis quickly erased the evidence of their crime. They recovered the body and placed it in the path so that it would look like the old king had simply stumbled. They filled in the pit with soil. Then the sinful son placed his father's crown on his head and mounted the golden throne of Arabia. A Devilish Curse Zahak longed to put his terrible crime behind him. He dismissed Iblis from the court and tried to rule with justice and compassion, but Ahriman had other plans. With the young king at his command, the evil spirit was determined to spread suffering throughout the world of humans. One day, an agreeable young stranger presented himself to the king. I am an excellent cook, said the man. It would be the greatest of all honors for me to nourish the body of such a noble monarch. Flattered by these warm words, Zahak accepted the man into his service. For the next few days, the new cook prepared delicious dishes from the flesh of birds and animals. Partridge and white pheasant meat, chicken and lamb kebabs, veal cooked with saffron and rose water. Rubbing his stomach, the delighted king summoned the cook and exclaimed, Your skill and devotion are truly incredible. What do you desire most in the world? Ask me, and I will grant it. I have only one desire, answered the cook. Although I am quite unworthy, I beg for the privilege of kissing your shoulders. This was a most unusual request, but the king had given his word. He nodded, and the cook stepped forward. Embracing his master as though they were equals, the man pressed his lips to the royal shoulders. Suddenly, two remarkable things happened. The man, who was really Ahri when in disguise, vanished and two black snakes began to grow from Zahak's shoulders. The king and his court cried out in horror. Zahak tried to pull off the snakes, but they were stuck as firmly as the limbs on a tree. He hacked them off with his sword, but they grew right back again. He summoned the most learned physicians in the land. The men tried one remedy after another. Still, the monstrous serpents writhed and twisted on the king's shoulders. Then Ahriman appeared once more, this time in the guise of a wise old doctor. There is only one way to get rid of these growths, the evil spirit said solemnly. You must feed them human brains. Give them nothing but brains to eat, and in time they will sicken and die. From then on, two young men were dragged to the palace each morning. The victims were killed, and their brains were fed to the snakes. But the hissing monster showed no signs of dying. And Zahak, the serpent king, fell ever more deeply under Ahriman's power. 
fairy did the hero. While the people of the Arab land suffered, a dark cloud was also gathering over Persia. Jamshid, once the most splendid of kings, had fallen into pride and falsehood. When the foolish king proclaimed himself equal to Ormuzd, the great god withdrew Jamshid's divine glory. Petty lords sprang up on all sides, challenging the king's authority. The land was plunged into war as the contenders battled over who had the greater right to the throne. Finally, a group of Persian nobles made their way to the court of Arabia's famous serpent king. The desperate men begged the powerful monarch to liberate them from their oppressive ruler and restore peace to their land. So Hawk eagerly accepted the mission. Swift as the wind, he rode north with an army of Persians and Arabs. He captured the despised Persian king and had him sawed in two. Thus the reign of Jamshid came to an end, and Zahak became king of the whole world. The Persians soon learned to regret their choice of ruler. Under the reign of Zahak, goodness hid its face and wickedness flourished throughout the world. The king erected idols to false gods. He burned many cities and villages. He murdered many innocent people, including the two young men sacrificed each day to provide serpents with their evil nourishment. One night, Ormuzd sent a dream to trouble the wicked ruler. In his vision, Sahak saw a tall, shining warrior. The young man hit him over the head with an ox-headed mace and dragged him from the palace. Waking with a scream, the king sent for his priests and sorcerers. The learned men shook their heads and gave Sahak the news he was dreading. The dream was a sign that a young hero was coming to seize the throne. From that day on, Sahak could hardly sleep or eat for terror. He commanded his warriors to scour the world for the coming hero. Many more innocent people were slaughtered. Among the victims was a man named Abatine, who was descended from Tamoris, the great king known as the Binder of Demons. Abitin's wife had just given birth to a boy named Feridun. When her husband was killed, the woman fled north with her son. The child grew up in the Alborz Mountains, safely hidden from the king's assassins. He grew as tall and straight as a cypress tree, and all who saw him marveled at the royal splendor that shined from his face like the sun. When Feridun was sixteen years old, he asked his mother about his family. The bold young man's heart filled with pain and fury as he heard the story of his father's murder. He longed to rush straight to the palace and confront the evil monarch. Only his mother's pleading stopped him. The woman wept bitter tears and begged her son not to throw his life away. At last, Feridun agreed to delay his attack until he could gather enough followers to challenge the Sahak's powerful army. End of a tyrant. Fairy Dune would not have to wait long for his vengeance. At the very moment that he made his pledge to his mother, an extraordinary confrontation was taking place at the royal palace. Zahak was holding audience when a lowly blacksmith named Kava suddenly strode into the throne room. Kava's beloved son was about to be killed to feed the king's servants. Shaking his fist, the blacksmith demanded that the boy be free. Zahak nearly ordered his guards to seize the insolent commoner. Then a strange vision appeared before his eyes. A mountain of iron, tall and forbidding, seeming to rise up before Kava. Filled with foreboding, the shaken king meekly agreed to the blacksmith's demands. Kava and his son marched straight from the palace to the busy marketplace. There the blacksmith hoisted his leather apron on a spear as a rallying point. The day was my boy. Tomorrow it will be yours, he shouted. This evil king is Ahriman himself. We must free ourselves from Zahak's chains. A crowd of people quickly gathered around the leather banner, roaring their approval. Kava marched his men from the city and through the countryside, gathering more and more followers as they went along. He led his ragged army all the way to the mountains where the heir of Tamoris was waiting. Fairy Dune welcomed the army warmly. He took the humble leather flag and adorned it with brilliant jewels. He asked the blacksmith to make him a mace in the form of a massive ox head. 
Raising his weapon to the heavens, the noble youth set off to avenge his father. The warriors raced across the mountains and valleys. Soon the walls of the palace loomed before them. The hero raised his mace, and holy fire seemed to burst forth from his body. Urging his horse forward, he let forth a thunderous cry. The rebel army stormed the palace, crushing all of Zahak's sorcerers and demons and overturning all the false idols. At last, Fairy Dune faced Zahak in single combat. The serpent king leapt at his challenger with a glittering dagger. The hero brought his mace crashing down on Zahak's head, shattering the king's helmet. He was about to deliver the killing blow when an angel of Ormazd appeared. Do not strike him again, said the shining messenger. Bind him and take him to the mountains. So Fairy Dune bound Zahak's arms and legs with strips of lion skin. He dragged the wretched captive to Mount Tamavand. There Zahak was imprisoned in a deep, dark cave, where he would suffer until the end of time. Then Fairy Dune returned to the palace and ascended the throne. The whole earth rejoiced at the overthrow of Zahak and the rise of the brave new king. For the next five hundred years, Fairy Dune would rule over a world free from evil, and all the people would enjoy peace and good fortune. Mythical Creatures Rostam and his Marvelous Horse Many incredible creatures populate the world of ancient Persian mythology. There are fearsome dragons, demons, and monsters. There are also friendly beasts that use their magical powers to protect Persia and its heroes. One of the most famous of these helpful mythical creatures is Raksh. This magnificent horse was said to have the strength of an elephant and the speed of a racing camel. His courage, intelligence, and loyalty made him the perfect partner for the greatest of all Persian heroes, Rustam. According to Ferdowsi's Shanava, Rustam lived in the turbulent days following the reign of Fairy Dune. The good king's death had led to a long period of war and upheaval. Over several centuries, the Persians fought a series of battles with the northern kingdom of Turan. Rus or, what's it say here? Turan is an ancient region in Central Asia, north of the Oxus River. Its exact location is unknown. Rustam was the foremost champion of the Persians' side. With the help of his brave and faithful horse, Raksh, he spent his life defending his country against invading armies, dangerous demons, and other perils. Most of the stories in the Shanama are based on ancient tales that had also been told in the Avesta, the Zoroastrian holy book created many centuries earlier. However, Rustam was never mentioned in the Avesta. His adventure seemed to have belonged to another set of traditional stories which originated in a different part of Persia. These tales were so popular that Ferdowsi decided to work them into his grand chronicle of Persian history. Whatever the origins of Rustam, countless generations of Iranians have celebrated him as the ideal example of strength, courage, virtue, and devotion to country. Look who's here. It's the cat. At my cats, don't, don't, no, s -s -s -s. no, no, cat. That's a bad idea. Okay, come on into my lap. You know the drill. Here's an up close shot of my cat's back. <laughs> come on, kitty. Come on. Look at all his little hairs. Every hair on his body is striped. Isn't that cool? Every single one. They're all striped. Come on, kitty. Let's go. Come into my lap now. You're ruining the entire shot once again. Come on. There you go. There you go. Come on. I know you're an old man, but you can go faster than that. I've seen you. I've seen your zoomies. He's fighting me. Okay, come on, kitty. Let's go. Come on, no. I'm. This is a really good story. I want to read it. Please don't sit on the library book. Oh my gosh. I know, kitty. Okay, well, let me move the book. Oh. <laughs> cat. Come on, cat. Come on, cat. There. I have freed the book from the cat.
just grab the cat. Okay, I moved him. He's not happy. <laughs> My poor cat. I'm sorry. I love you. Just relax. Stop trying to fight me. Okay. A horse fit for a hero. From the day of his birth, Rustam was marked for greatness. He was such a large infant that he could not be born in the usual manner. Instead, a priest had to cut open his sleeping mother to bring him into the world. When the woman awoke, she smiled at the sight of her noble child, whose face shined like the sun and the evening star together. Rustam grew up in troubled times. Following the death of Feridun, the kingdom of the Persians had suffered under one weak king after another. Eager to take advantage of the confusion, the king of Turan sent his son Afrasiab sorry, to seize his neighbor's throne. As the Turanian prince led his army south, the Persians turned to Zal, the country's great warrior who had served as their country's loyal champion under four kings, and Zal, whose back was bent with age, turned to his noble son, Rustam. You have grown as tall as a cypress tree, said Zal, yet you are still a boy. How can I ask you to take on the task of a seasoned warrior when your heart still yearns for the pleasures of youth? Rustam answered Zal, Wine, feasting, and comfort mean nothing to me. All I ask is to fight our country's foes but I will need a war horse strong and brave if I am to defend Persia. The young hero's words filled his father's heart with pride. Saul swiftly dispatched men throughout the kingdom, searching for a steed fit for his son. Great herds were driven before Rustam. Whenever he saw a fine horse, the towering youth pressed the palm of his hand against his back. Each time the animal's belly sagged to the ground, not one of his horses was strong enough to bear the weight of such a mighty hero. At last, a, gray, a large gray mare galloped by. Behind the mare came a remarkable black-eyed foal. The young horse had a chest as broad as a lion's. Its lustrous golden red coat sparkled like jewels in the sun. It held its tail high and ran faster than a racing camel on its hooves of iron. Quickly, the hero flung his lasso over the foal's head. The mother horse came charging to her young one's defense. As she opened her mouth to bite Rustam, here comes my cat again, he's really upset at me. <laughs> okay, go lie down and go to sleep. Move, okay, there he goes. Sorry for the shaking camera. <laughs> it's a big old cat. Uh, the mother horse came charging to her young one's defense. As she opened her mouth to bite Rustam, the young man roared like a lion. Thunderous sound stopped the mare in her tracks. Turning in terror, she scrambled off to rejoin her herd. Rustam pulled the foal close, calming it with gentle words. He pushed down on its back with all his strength, but the horse stood firm. Who owns this magnificent foal? he asked. The herdsman who had brought the horses answered, My lord, no one knows who owns him. For two years he has run wild among my horses, and no one has been able to capture him. All I know is that he has always been called Rustam's Raksh. I am Rustam. What is the price of the foal? If you are indeed Rustam, the price is Persia itself, replied the man. Take him and defend our land from its enemies. So Rustam set his saddle on Raksh. The swift and powerful horse took off like a magical creature, carrying his rider across the land. Everywhere the hero and his marvelous horse went, they inspired the people to take arms against Persia's foes. Rustam outsmarts a demon. Together, Rustam and Raksh had many adventures and faced many deadly perils. They fought a ferocious lion, a hideous witch, and a fire-breathing dragon. They nearly died of thirst crossing a waterless desert. They battled Prince Afrasiab, <laughs> can't say his name, hurling him from his saddle and forcing his army to flee back to Turan. Rustam also fought many dangerous demons. His battle against the dreadful demon Akvan came during the reign of Kekusro. One day a herdsman came to the royal court, asking the king for help. A wild ass has appeared in my herd, the man reported chases the horses and breaks their necks with a snap of its powerful jaws. 
Kusuro know that no, no wild ass could be stronger than a horse, he decided to send Rustam to deal with the mysterious animal. Go and fight this creature the king commanded. But be careful, for it may be Ahriman himself, who is always looking for ways to harm his mortals. At once Rustam rode out to the plains. He saw the creature racing over the ground like the north wind. The ugly beast had a head as big as an elephant's and a mouthful of boar's tusks. When Rustam galloped near, it disappeared right before his eyes. That was when the hero knew that he was dealing with Akvan, the dangerous demon who could take the form of any animal and had the power of invisibility. For three days and nights, Rustam pursued his quarry. Each time he came close enough to shoot his bow, the demon simply vanished. At last, the hero was so exhausted that he lay down beside a stream. The moment he fell asleep, Akvan attacked. The monster transformed itself into a storm wind and scooped up the hero. Rustam awoke to find himself whirling around in the sky. Make a wish, mighty hero, the demon shouted with an evil laugh. Shall I throw you into the ocean or to drown, or hurl you to your death on a mountain top? Rustam had to think quickly. He knew that his bones would be smashed if he were dropped on a mountain, while he had a chance to survive in the ocean. At the same time, he suspected that the cruel demon would turn his wishes upside down, so he begged his enemy to throw him to earth, and just as he had expected, Akvan flung him into the sea. The hero drew his sword as he plunged into the watery depths. He rose to the surface, only to find himself surrounded by hungry sharks and sea monsters. With his right arm, he fended off the fierce creatures. With his left arm and his legs, he swam. Drawing on his great strength, he finally made it to dry land. Once he had rested, Rustam rode his faithful horse back to the stream where he had encountered Akvan. The demon was so astonished to see the young warrior alive and well that it forgot to make itself invisible. Quickly, Rustam flung his lasso, capturing the monster. He raised his mace like a blacksmith's hammer. Then he brought the heavy weapon down with a powerful blow, smashing Akvan's skull to bits. After his great victory, Rustam returned to the, cor the court of Kei Kusro. The king and all his nobles sang the praises of the hero who had set out to capture a wild ass and ended up defeating a demon. Two weeks passed in merry feasting, songs, and storytelling. Then the champion of Persia mounted his marvelous horse and rode off in search of new adventures. Founding of Zoroastrianism, the life of Zarathustra. Very little is known about Zarathustra, also known as Zardosht or Zoroaster, the prophet who founded the dominant religion of the ancient Persian Empire. Modern day scholars have pieced together an outline of his life from ancient sources that offer a confusing blend of history, religion, and mythology. Hmm. These include the Gathas set of hymns believed to have been composed by the prophet himself, and the Pahlavi texts, religious books written centuries later by the followers of Zoroastrianism. According to clues found in these sources, Zarathustra may have lived in Central Asia sometime between 1800 and 1500 BCE. As a young man, he served as a priest of his tribe's age-old religion. At some point, he had a mystical vision of Ahura Mazda. In this vision, Ahura Mazda revealed the principles of a religion based on the belief in one supreme god rather than many different gods. Zarathustra devoted the rest of his life to spreading the word about this new faith. Following Zarathustra's death, the story of his life was told and retold by his followers. Gradually, the figure of Zarathustra became the hero of a sacred tale with many fantastic elements. According to that tale, the coming of the prophet was foretold from the beginning of the world. Miracles surrounded the birth of his mother as well as his own birth and childhood. As he carried out his divine mission, he faced threats from both human opponents and evil demons. He overcame all these obstacles with the help of his great wisdom and the miraculous powers granted to him by Ahura Mazda. The sacred account of Zarathustra's life has inspired generations of Zoroastrians from ancient times through the present day. In this well-loved narrative, the prophet serves as an example of the ideal man 
who remained steadfast in his faith despite all trials and temptations. His story is a call for his followers to remain equally faithful and courageous. It is also a promise that the forces of goodness will ultimately triumph over evil. The Birth of Zarathustra When it was nearly time for Zarathustra to come into the world, Ahura Mazda sent the light of the sun, moon, and stars down to the earth. The divine glory entered the fire burning in the home of a man and his wife. From the fire, the radiance flew out into the wife's body. Time passed, and the woman gave birth to a baby girl named Dugdava. And the little girl, who was destined to become the mother of the prophet, shined with a light brighter than any fire. Demons who serve Agramani knew that the divine glory could mean their downfall. Hoping to injure Dugdava, they afflicted her village with bitter winters, deadly diseases, and other catastrophes. They whispered that the young girl with the mysterious light was the cause of all these hardships. The rumors that they started spread through the village, and Duktova's father was forced to send his daughter to live with a far-off family. But the angels watched over the poor maiden. They guided her safely to her new home. They also made sure that her new family included a young man named Purushaspa, who was fated to become her husband. Soon the young bride conceived a child. Three days before the baby's birth, the village began to glow like the sky before the dawn. The whole world held its breath. Then Zarathustra was born, and all the animals, plants, and waters of the good creation rejoiced. Meanwhile, in the home of the new parents, the midwives gasped at the sight of the radiant man-child. The remarkable infant did not cry like other babies. He laughed out loud, for he was already aware of his glorious mission on earth. Marvels and Miracles When Zarathustra was still a child, the demons tried again and again to destroy him. Using their evil powers, they twisted Purushaspa's mind until he believed that his son's radiant glory was a sign of the devil. In his madness, the father placed the infant on a pile of wood. He set the wood on fire, but the crackling flames refused to touch the boy. Next, the deluded man laid Zarathustra in the path of a stampeding herd of oxen. One old ox stood guard over the baby until the danger was past. Then Purushaspa left his son in the den of a fierce she-wolf. Instead of attacking the boy, the wolf cared for him like one of her own cubs. Zarathustra survived these and many other attempts on his life. He grew into a fine young man known far and wide for his wisdom and virtue. By the age of thirty, he had become a respected priest of the old religion, but his heart still longed for a higher truth and greater righteousness. One morning, Zarathustra went to the river to fill his jug for a sacred ritual. As he emerged from the waters, he saw a tall figure clothed in, clothed in pure sunlight. "'Who are you?' asked the awestruck priest. "'I am Vohumana, good thought. "'Come with me, O seeker of righteousness.' and I will take you to the one who created you. So the young priest followed the angel up to the blue sky. They climbed to a place where the light was so brilliant that at first Zarathustra was blinded. Then his vision cleared, and he beheld the Amishas Pentas and the Supreme Lord and Creator, Ahura Mazda. Zarathustra listened reverently as the divinities instructed him on the good religion. They told the young man that there was only one true God, the creator of all the good things in the universe. They taught him about the eternal struggle between good and evil. I have chosen you to carry my divine word to the people, said Ahura Mazda. Teach them how to live righteous lives. Teach them the power of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. Then the Supreme God gave his prophet powerful prayers and spells for protection against the forces of darkness. For the next few years, Zarathustra traveled about the land, preaching the word of Ahura Mazda. Many nobles and priests condemned the prophet whose teachings threatened the old order. Many demons tried to kill him or to tempt him away from righteousness. All their efforts were in vain. Zarathustra remained resolute in his faith. He confounded his human enemies with his wisdom and shattered the demons with his God-given spells. When 
whenever he grew weary of his struggles, Ahura Mazda sent another divine vision and granted him the strength to carry on with his mission. After ten years of preaching, Zarathustra finally made his first important convert, King Vishtaspa. Jealous priests and counselors had convinced the powerful eastern ruler that the prophet was an evil sorcerer. Vishtaspa had thrown Zarathustra into his deepest dungeon. Then a miracle occurred. The king's favorite horse was stricken with a mysterious disease that left its legs bent and paralyzed. The prophet sent word that he would heal the animal under four conditions. Vishtapa must accept the new religion, his queen must also convert, his son must fight for the faith, and the names of the plotters must be revealed. One by one the king agreed to the conditions. One by one the stallion's legs unbent until the animal was prancing about once again. Following that miracle, the king and all his court accepted the good, re the good religion. Zarathustra's heavenly teachings spread throughout the kingdom and on to other lands and other peoples. The faithful prophet lived to the, to the age of 77 when he was murdered by an unbeliever. Even after his death, the fire of the religion that he founded would continue to burn brightly through the centuries. the end of that story. All those wonderful ancient stories. This is such a cool book. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope you had a very good, good, good night. Good night. Good night.